tomorrow, Brother Anthony. Well, Brother Billy, let me tell you something. Well, let me tell you a few things, starting with something. Mm -hmm. Something leads to a few things which are really other things, you know. Mm -hmm. anyway, I grew up in a family, well, there was just, well, I had six brothers and sisters. And, and well, uh, but living in the family because we all got dispersed at a very young age. So we, my grandmother put us back together, so basically it was, a, it was a, a five of us, you know, and then we make six, you know. Because one of the brothers, he was, well, it's a long story, he's, he, he wasn't raised with us anyway. So I'm used to this, how you say, this unit kind of thing. I want to say unit because I'm going to get to military matters later, you know, unit. And then, you know, but I realized everything I've ever done, it was a uh, groups of people. You know, I, don't get me wrong, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of those loner, loner people that runs around, but I'm comfortable with groups too. In fact, I get a lot of stuff done with groups. In fact, one of my friends once said to me, my friends was my fraternity brother, Ron Mason, he said, you know, Anthony, you know, you're really good uh, with groups, large groups, but interpersonal relationships, a little lacking there. Those are the words he used, but a little lacking. Mm -hmm. But this really got me to thinking as far as groups because uh, I realized that sometimes one individual makes a huge difference, not only in their life, but in the world. Like for instance, I was just boning uh, up reading, reading about this guy. Uh, uh, what was his name? What was his name? A World War II guy. The guy that, that uh, 007, the James Bond fictional characters based on Bill something, Bill Stevenson or something like that, you know. And you know, this this guy, you know, right before World War II hit, you know, he was, you know, he was running around doing stuff, being a spy. But he was headquarters in the United States. Now you have to understand, the United States when you're doing a spy thing, uh, and he was known, I mean not known, but you know, he's he's British. Well he was Canadian. But he, you know, it's British, Canadian, same thing, you know, whatever. So anyway, he, um, what happened was, yeah, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president at the time, you know, he had the president's ear, you know, because the British and the Americans had some sort of thing going, Churchill and all the rest of the people. So they allowed uh, this guy, Stevenson guy, whatever his name was, they allowed him to hang out and do some spy networking things with, you know, with the British. British interests. Of course, J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI, he didn't like people jumping on his turf. But you would notice J. Edgar Hoover didn't bother him because since he was a spy, and J. Edgar Hoover was effectively, even though it was the FBI, he was a spy too. He was spying on a bunch of people, getting dirt on people so he can get things done, you see. But he couldn't spy on this guy. So it was kind of interesting. But then I read something else. Right after World War II, there was a thing, the Korean War. Now, I, I, one of my favorite journalists of all time is a uh, this guy named I.F. Stone. I.F. Stone's kind of guy, like in journalism, you know, like these days, you know, uh, uh, the president's spokesman says something, and all the TV people and all the news people, they put a microphone, get what he said, then they go and type up what he says. They're stenographers, they're not reporters, they're not investigating nothing. They just take what the guy says, whatever he says, ask him a couple of questions, and he just quickly diverts, and <laughs> there's, your, there's your news item for tonight. And they fill up the stuff with a bunch of news items, which means absolutely nothing. Nothing. Hey, but I have stone. What he do? He'd look in the congressional record. He'd look, he look. He wouldn't ask nobody anything. He'd go dig and see what they said here, there, and there, and come back and tell the people. Now, one of the books he, he, he wrote, which got banned. Well, I say banned, but the CIA took it off, off all the shelves they could. It was a thing called it was the hidden history of the Korean War. And in that book, it shows how one person, namely one, one of these, one of these. Uh, what do you call them, uh, the Dulles boys, one of them Dulles brothers, you know, had the ear of Truman, and then this whole thing happened, and then between this Dulles guy and MacArthur, they really started the Korean conflict. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So I was thinking about all that stuff, you know, and I'm going, you know, I know a situation like that in my own personal situation. Something, was, uh, to me it was positive. I told you before that I worked for this organization, this, this program, this daily hard-hitting national news program in the United States called Democracy Now! I was the engineer. Well, it started as a radio program, WBAI Radio, 
they got kicked out of the station because of this coup that I mentioned before, and ended up in this this uh, downtown television. Uh, and I thought an outreach center for young people to learn how to do television. It was up there in the Gary. It was an old firehouse up there in the Gary. And so we were doing a regular radio program, like it is. And, uh, then this guy comes up. And uh, at the time, we had this conflict because of the airwaves, the people, our core audience was in, say, Manhattan, Manhattan and the Bronx, and more Queens and stuff like that. But our signal wasn't reaching them because the, 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 the Pacifica network, or so people in the Pacifica network, prevented, you know, uh, I was being broadcast over the New York station and a bunch of other stations too. So this guy came up there and, this, and you know, he knew about the situation. His name was Rick Jurgens. He worked for a place called Manhattan Neighborhood Network. It was early days of cable, you know. I said, so in, in cable in the United States, they have to, the cables, people have to have a, 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 a what do you call it, a public access. So that was Manhattan Neighborhood Act, and the Network was one of those public access names. So he comes up there one time, we were finishing up the program. And you know, and he says, look, why don't y'all just open up the cameras? And I'm looking at Amy, Amy's looking at me. Well, there was a camera there, but we figured we were just, we were just throwing stuff up there because we was in this place. They said, this is, a, this is a satellite studio from Manhattan Neighborhood Network. If you open up the camera, we'll take the feed. Then this other guy, he contacted this other guy, Free Speech Television. Free Speech Television will then rebroadcast it the day after. And then we you know, and people in Manhattan and a bunch of people who got the subscription and it would heard of interesting. So that's what happened. They actually opened up the cameras. For this one guy, Rick Jurgens, opened up the cameras because of his suggestion. Well, we'll do what was going on. And before you know it, this democracy now grew from just a radio program to something that would be carried on the alternative networks. And to this and now and then then people saw first we used to put up a newspaper and stuff. It was a Interesting, I think you get those early videos of it. But more importantly, what really happened was people started watching, you know, and then some Hollywood set decorator guy or whatever, you know, he saw it, so he changed the set. And the program right now, they now they have their own place and everything like that in New York. And it's a it's a juggernaut. Still but to see the principles remain the same. Now I bring up all that because to me, no matter what anybody says, it was one guy that changed, Rick Jurgens, that changed that situation to what it is today. A hard hitting, no no sponsored, you know, whatever thing that you don't you they don't take sides on anything. You ask the questions, you get the answers, and you don't get the usual suspects. I learned a little bit then. One person. You have to ask yourself, could you be that one person? In fact you don't ask yourself that. You're just in a position, you do what you do. If you are that one person, it happens. Well, this is my recollection, is my my observation. And this is also one of those dispatches from the Austrian American said that would be me, T, for the Patterson State of Trenches, to be letting you know what I only suspect. Mm -hmm.